My goal for today is to talk about our strategy, talk about how can Hungary win the 21st century in a very, very complex geopolitical situation. This is, uh, what is said, opening up or locking in, how we react on the changing ge geopolitical equilibrium. So let's take the question seriously. How can Hungary win the 21st century? There are three, at least three important elements um, of this question. First, Hungary. Um, are you, or please raise your hands up if you are not born in Hungary, if you are a foreigner. How many foreigners do we have? Okay, it's around uh, 30 percent, like the opposition in the parliament. Uh, but then it's not, then it's a useful, um, it's a useful slide because uh, you can learn more about Hungary. It's a uh, According to my understanding, as you heard, it's the most beautiful country on earth, in the middle of uh, Europe, in the middle of Carpathian Basin. Not, not a big one, because uh, it's 108, the territory, according to, to the uh, ratings. The population, 10 million people, 93. This is the, our ranking. Export product, 35, so we are deeply connected and, uh, and uh, inside um, the global economy. We are quite a safe country, as you can see. The military strength, so our muscles are uh, still not okay, but not so bad as it used to be. We are working on that very hard. Probably you, you heard about the military program of the government. And as you can see, we have many Nobel Prize winners. We have many Olympic medals and medalists. So I, I think that our fellow citizens are, are quite talented. So this is the starting point. Small, open uh, country, quite successful, no natural resources, um, actually, although we are in the middle of the Carpathian Basin, but culturally we are an island. We speak a language which is uh, not understood by, by anybody else. So this is the starting point. This is what Hungary means. Second part of the question is winning. What does it mean, winning, in politics? Actually, this is the question of the questions. Uh, so, so how you define success? how you define a successful country, and how you define successful politics. This is the, this is the most important question. If you have an answer, it, it tells everything about you, about your, your political background, about your principles. So first of all, we should define what does it mean winning? What does it mean being successful? Is it possible to have a successful country with total equality? Could it be the cornerstone of, uh, of a success strategy of the country? Total equality. If you were a socialist, then you probably your answer would be yes. Total equality is the ultimate goal. If you reach that, then you are successful. According to our understanding, this is, uh, this is not a very bold idea. So uh, we all know how wonderful socialist ideas started about equality, about fighting inequality, and how it ended up human suffering, wars, slavery, and so on and so on. How you define success, whether you are able to save the planet, your planet, or not. So the very important thing, saving the planet makes a country successful. But again, how it started and how it's going right now. Right now, many climate movements are about saving the planet or saving the nature through destroying civilization and destroying everything which was produced by humankind. Does it make sense? Does it provide success? According to my understanding, no. Third one, open borders. The world is divided by borders, divided by nations. If we can get rid of the idea of nations, and finally we could unite the, 
the humankind into a, a global civilization that we're going to be successful. This is the basic idea of uh, the Refugees Welcome Movement. But how it's going, you can see the images, you can see the pictures, you can see uh, the videos on a daily basis is going to be uh, nasty. It is going to be violent. It is going to destroy uh, what we think is first to preserve. Our freedom of choice. What makes a country successful? Freedom. Freedom of the people. If you can decide freely what to do and how to live your life, then it's the most developed way of human civilization and human being. So let's uh, start liberalization drugs. As it happened in the United States, how it's going, you can see some uh, images about that. So our answer, and I know it's highly, question it's highly questionable, but this is our belief in the government and in Hungary, that these are not the defining and defining ways of how make a country successful. And it's not part of the history, it's part of our everyday life. This picture is about the current leaders of Brussels institution, the former president of uh, the European Commission, is uh, celebrating uh, the introduction and the building up of a statue of Karl Marx. So again, nothing, under, nothing new under the sun. Same ideas are coming back, saving the world, fighting for total equality, fighting for freedom of people, fighting for open borders, fighting for uh, saving the planets, and then it goes into, it, it turns into a very bad direction. But it's not over. It's starting and starting again. We have a different answer. This is our answer. This is the official strategy of the Hungarian government. This is a fresco from Siena, allegory of bad and good governance, 14th century. What do you see on the picture? You see peace and prosperity. Peace and prosperity. It's very hard to see it at first sight because it's not a Netflix series, but you know, these are, these are just happy people. These are just happy people who are dancing. These are the shops which are full with products. Look at the houses, how nice they are. You know, look at the colors. Everybody is happy. Happy while doing their job, having a safe and secure environment. And you feel the economic power, right? You feel that these people are doing good. This is another image. It's actually, today, it's, this uh, fresco is also seen at the seen, uh, uh, town hall. And the idea of painting this fresco was that all the city council members, meanwhile they are doing everyday decision makings, they have to see these frescoes. So they have to face the consequences of their everyday decision, whether the decision what they are making in the 14th century will cause something which is close to that or the opposite. This is the same um, allegory of good governance. You can see the half angel there. You can see the fields. You can see, again, security. Uh, you can see how, how fat the pig is. It's well, uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful scenery. It's, a, it's, it's, it's Toscany. Okay, and let's see the other side of the town hall, allegory of bad governance. There is a guy here, not having a sun bias, but, but it's actually he is stabbed, he is killed. You can, all the shops are closed. There is only one shop which is operating. This produce uh, ammunition, armory. They are just, I don't know, trying to rape somebody. The buildings are, are destroyed, the, the windows are broken. So it's actually also, it's a nice, although it's a nice picture, you don't want to live here. And what happened with the fields? No production, agriculture is there, military is here, they are just 
you know, trying to occupy and destroy everything and burn down to the ground. The village is destroyed. The river is poisoned. What else? The warlord is here. This is kind of a cemetery. So everything is destroyed. It's a clear sign of decay. So if you, if you go and take a plane and, and land in, in Switzerland or land in Lesotho and you leave the airport, you immediately see the difference. There, you don't need any help to explain to you which is a more successful country and which is the less successful country. Because if you look around, there is safety, there is order, there is law, there is peace, there is prosperity. And if you talk about the less successful country, there is disorder, there is decay, there is um, insecurity, and so on and so on. So according to our understanding, if you want to have a successful country, if you want to have a winning strategy, then you have to focus on not the ideological point of views, not basic principles, but do good to the people. Do good to your own citizens. Help them to have a more peaceful, more secure, and more prosperous life. This is what we're doing in Hungary. Um, if, you, if you don't like 14th century, then probably you like, uh, like uh, 21st century politics. I don't want to scare you. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's probably too much for you. Um, but as I heard, it's a politically incorrect festival, so I can say that. But if, if Americans are using Make America Great Again as a slogan, and we Hungarians are using Make Hungary Great Again, not Big Great Again, then this is what we're talking about. So, let's talk about the third phrase. What is 21st century about? Just if you open the press, you see the headlines, migration, aliens, gender, World Bank, global economy at risk, something with space, health, and sustainability. So there are many, it's, it's a, it's big, there is a big noise and very hard to choose. My recommendation would be this. How to survive a superpower split? How to survive a superpower split? Because what is going on right now, whether you like it or not, according to our understanding, it's a natural phenomenon. It's not a moral issue, but what is going on is, as it was described by the wonderful Sir Roger Scruton, the West and the rest. The rest is coming up. China, India, Brazil, BRICS countries are getting, from an economical point of view, more and more successful. Meanwhile, traditional Western countries, which dominated the 20th century and the 19th century, they are still very significant. Some of them are not declining. Okay, the European powers, probably yes, but the United States not. But what you, you see as a new kind of equilibrium is, uh, is here with us. So this is going to be the most important challenge for all of us in the 21st century. How we react on this. You cannot deny the fact that something is happening. It's not about being anti-West or pro-East or pro-West and anti-East. It's about how the solar system is working. Now you can see at least two players in the game. You see multipolarity or bipolarity. We don't know, but this geopolitical shift is happening and it, it is going to affect how we react on that. It is going to affect our everyday uh, life. And I was born in 1986. So according to the statistics, I'm going to leave until um, 2050, if things are going well, until 2060, if my kids are not stopping wake up early, then probably around 2040. But you know, my two boys, my two sons, 
were born in, in 2019 and 2021. So according to statistics, they're going to be on earth until the end of century. So this is, this is quite a challenge for everybody, even those who were born in, um, in Hungary, which is far from the United States and far from China. And the question is how we react on that. And it's not a decided question. I try to collect you images which are talking about American and Chinese cooperation and friendship. These images are about American and Chinese. These are not fake images. These are all real images and articles. But these articles are, they are not produced or published today, but 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago. So meanwhile, there is a, a geopolitical rivalry and the changing equilibrium going on. There was a period of time when, when China and United States of America was, um, they were friends. But what we see now, what are the images? You know, the, first the panda bear, how, it, how China was uh, described by the cartoonist. I don't know if you realized, first it was a panda bear, but now it's always a dragon. Like, like they changed panda, panda bear to a dragon. And the United States, you know, it's like, it's like, it's always been a bald eagle because that's the symbol of uh, United States. But the bald eagle could be very, very modest and very peaceful. Now the bald eagle is, is quite scary, always. It's, it's becoming bigger. It's becoming more strong and hostile. So something is changing. Something is in the air and not love. Love is not anymore in the air between United States and, and, um, and China. And Houston, we have a problem. According to, to the scientific literature, Graham Ellison, probably the most famous one, who wrote a book about the Thucydides trap, which comes from a historical example that the rise of Athens and the fear that this inspired in uh, Sparta, that made war inevitable. So the war between Athens and Sparta, first the decision was made in minds, and then it turned into a physical confrontation and turned into the war. This book says that the war is not inevitable. So we can avoid war. He identified, Graham Ellison, 16 examples when the rising power, and there was a hegemon, and the power shift or the power rebalancing caused either war or it was a peaceful transition uh, process. And according to him, he identified 16 examples. And according to him, in 14 cases, this story ended up with a war. And there are only four cases when it didn't end with the war. It was a peaceful global transition. So the question for actually for everybody, everybody else in the room, we have two, two elephants. We don't know what they're going to do with each other. Previously, in the last decades, they, they were like, like partners. Some of them are saying lovers. But now they are getting more and more hostile to each other. And we are the mouses in the room with these two elephants together. So what should we do? Obviously, the scientific literature provides us various answers. But I think that the Hungarian answer should be obvious. The war is not inevitable. A war between the two superpowers, it's against the interest of the rest. It's against the interest of Hungary. And if it goes into a confrontation, we don't want to take sides. We just want to have respectful, equal, mutual relationship with everybody. We just want to live as it was recommended by the painter of the fresco in, um, in uh, Siena Town Hall, in a peaceful and prosperous way. So what should be done? If we follow this lead, then what we should do and what we should say 
is that if you're going in turning this word order into confrontation, we are not going to follow you. We are going to find our own way. If you're going to decoupling, if you're talking about stopping economic cooperation, if the Chinese ask us to stop economic cooperation with the Americans, then we say no. If the Americans ask us to stop economic cooperation with the Chinese, we say no. We want to have trustworthy, peaceful, prosperous, economically mutual, beneficiary relationship with everybody. A win-win situation, or as somebody is saying, a win-win-win situation. And there is a concept which is actually describing this role and this kind of geopolitical instability and insecurity, it, it will provide an era of the rising uh, uh, small and um, mid powers. Because if you are able to turn your country into a keystone state, keystone, the expression, it comes from architecture. If you, have, if you are building an arch or a vault, then the stone, which is in the middle, it's probably just one stone with the same size as the others. But according to the architects and according to physics, this is the most important stone. This is the keystone. Because this is the one which provides stability, which connects eastern flank and the western flank. This is, this is not bigger or more powerful than the other stones. But this is the one which is, which is playing the stabilizing role and which is, which is according to all the architects, the most important and most beautiful uh, stone of the arch of, or of the wall. So the strategy is to turn Hungary into a keystone state. And how, why we think that it's worth to try. I would give you three reasons why, according to us, it's worth to try. First is geography, because if you see, if you look on the map, you see the trade routes between East and West. These are the traditional trade routes back in the Middle East, but it's still the same. And look Hungary, Hungary is in the center. So it's not the periphery, it's in the middle. If there is trade between East and West, between Asia, Middle East, Central Asia, Far Asia, and also Africa and Europe, then you have to go through Hungary. And now we are a member of NATO, so a member of the military alliance structure. We are a safe country. We are a member of EU. So it means if you reach Hungary, then you have access to the entire European market. So this is really, Hungary is really a gateway. And we have the Ukrainian-Russian terrible, terrible, horrible war. And all the trade routes, but, but because of the, as a consequence of this war, because of this war, all the trade routes between East and West, North from us, they are now closed. And no one knows what will happen with them. Probably it can happen that it's going to remain closed for like 10 years. Then the only trade route between East and West. We go through Hungary. Second, um, culture or sociology. As the Hungarian tribes, uh, probably all the Hungarians obviously knew about that, but probably all the, all the foreigners also heard about that, that the Hungarian tribes came from far east and they occupied the land here in the middle of the Carpathian Basin 1,100 years ago. So we have Eastern heritage uh, as well. We are member, for example, of the Turkish Council, observing members. And if you go to Azerbaijan, they call us brothers, and we call them brothers. Um, why is that? Because they remember how history started. They remember that the Hungarian tribes back in 1,300 years probably lived together on the big Asian plains. So, and it's still, we are the ones, we are the Westerners who understand Easterners. And we are the Easterners who became Westerners.
This is the only country in Europe which can tell this story and which can build on this as a strength. Third one, according to the Harvard Economic Complexity Index, Hungary is currently the 11th in the global economy complexity ranking. It doesn't matter what you read in the opposition press. This is a fact. 11th most complex economy we have in Hungary. It's about uh, tourism, service sector, car industry, motor vehicles, batteries, transportation, computers, and so on, and so on, and so on, commodities. So this is a complex economy, and this is a complex place where Eastern technology and Western technology can meet, and can merge, and can work together, and create value. So it's not something which, which should be reached in just 10 years' time. This is the current situation. This is the starting point. This is the advantage what we can build on. So, and this would be my last, um, last slide. If we take seriously the idea of connectivity and saying no to decoupling and telling the world that this, this country is going to remain dedicated of peaceful cooperation and of the idea of connectivity, according to my understanding, these are the things which should be followed. FDI, so foreign direct investment, if from everywhere. If you want to be a, a developed country, then in 10, 15, 20 years' time, you have to have intensive FDI inflow. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Intensive FDI inflow from east, from west, from north, from south, from everywhere. Have developed infrastructure. If you want to be a keystone state and you don't have infrastructure, then you are lost. We're talking about highways, we're talking about railways, we're talking about airports, we're talking about border stations, logistic parks, everything. The third one, help regional and national champions. You have to have your own champions. You have to have a leading company as it is in South Korea. They have their own leading companies. We have our own leading companies. We have to support them in energy, uh, in the banking sector, in the telecommunication sector, in the military industry. Support and boost your national champions. The fourth, choose the sectors and industries where you can break out. You have to find the sectors. We take this is the reason why we take military industry, for example, just give you one example, very seriously. Car industry, very seriously. These are the breaking points. We will be number one, not just in Europe, not just compared to the population, but, but, um, but in, in, in real terms, we are going to be number one, number two, number three on the world in these industries. Fifth, don't give up your own values. I know it's also politically incorrect, sorry to say that, but connectivity inside the West is about Christianity. This is the only ideological form which connects us. If I want to talk uh, to an Italian or an American or a German, then the only way how I can do it is through my Christian heritage. It's not about personal belief. Personal belief is important, but about the cultural tides. We understand each other much better than with others because they are Christians and they used to be Christians in the past thousand years. Meanwhile, we are also Christians. Don't destroy these values, build on them. The sixth one, help organize your region. It's still a small country, still only 10 million with a population, still a small market. If you are on our own, if you are not connected with our neighbors, if you don't treat economically the entire Carpathian Basin as a complete structure, then we are going to be lost. We have to, we have to create win-win situations with the neighbors. We have to work together with our neighbors. Cultivate the next generation. This is about education, how we are trying to transfer education, how we are going to, to change the uh, higher education system, for example. Probably there will be some other speakers who are uh, putting this in the focus. Don't then neglect your own uh, culture. This is also very important. Meet your country uh, as a, make your country as a meeting point. 
So I don't know how many of you participated in the World Athletic Championship. Hands up, please. Okay, 20, 15%. But it's not a coincidence that we have such kind of sports events. This is an opportunity, this is a universal language, sport, which connects us. So we take this serious, and it's not only about sports. This is the house of music, built by a Japanese architecture, paying credit to, to music as a universal human, uh, human thing. So culture, music, festivals, sport events, be a meeting point, invite everybody, learn from them. Base your foreign policy on your national interest. If we give up our own national interest and we are not there to defend it in the international arena, if we are under heavy criticism, then we're going to lose. Because this is a strategy which will only work if you take it seriously and push the gas button for like 10 or 15 years, all the other players, all the big players, all the big elephants and the other mouses in the room will say that, oh, you shouldn't go to this direction, you should go to other direction. But we have to be able to explain and defend that this is our national interest and the foreign policy should be based on that. Protect yourself, safety, as you've seen, allegory of bad governments, this is very important. If you don't have safety, if you don't have military, if you don't respect law enforcement, if you don't make governmental decisions which are actually strengthening social stability, then you are lost. Social instability, lack of law and order, defund of police, lack of strong military, and everything is gone. Everything is gone because you're going to be a weak country which is not able to be successful in this very complex and very hard 21st century environment. And the last one, and this is where I'm going to stop, is uh, strive for political stability. I know, I'm biased. But political stability means you have to have a strong national government backed by the majority of the people, not just for four years, because if you have only four years, then to achieve this goal, it's too long period of time. You have to have a stable in environment, according to the prime minister, at least until 2034. This is the latest date, but who knows, you know. We will be on this word until 2050, 60, 70, and depends on your age. The more stability, political stability you have, the more likely you're going to make it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Palash. Now, uh, it is question time. So if you have a question, please raise your hand, make yourself known. Balaj, please take the seat over here. This is going to be my crucifixion here. Well, maybe. It's definitely not a witness dance. You can say whatever you want. Uh, do we have any questions in the audience? Yes, we have a gentleman over there. Um, I don't have a question. I have a statement and a comment, if I may. Of course. Um, let me just express this. Like Sid, I often get people asking me, why am I living in Hungary? I have four passports. I was born in Australia, grew up there, educated in the United States, set up my company in the UK, and intentionally moved my family to Hungary. So my son... You are the man of connectivity. You are my man. It's even more complex than that. I have a very deep multinational heritage. And with pride, two weeks ago I became a Hungarian citizen. By choice, not because of necessity. And Please give a huge applause to him. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Welcome. The reason I'm making this statement is actually for the youth of Hungary, because I often hear this comment, ah, oh, I want to go to the UK, I want to go to the USA, I want to go somewhere. Don't underestimate the, the wealth, the value, and most importantly, the safety that Hungary offers you and your family. My wife and I never worried when our son left at the age of 12 to travel throughout the city of Budapest. There is no way in a million years we would have allowed that to happen in the UK, and perhaps not even in Australia. So safety and security, amongst other things, was a big draw card to Hungary. And I'd like to say to my fellow Hungarian citizens, thank you. Thank you very much.
Thank you. That's a nice Just warm a sentiment. Side note. Sorry, sorry, sorry. One side note. You are not working for the government, right? No, not at all. You can so, pick up your check so at the door, by the way. So it's not a fake conversation. <laughs> Do we have any questions it's on this side? It's not like a North Korean type of discussion. Yes, we've got a gentleman over there in the black, I believe, the Timothy Chalamet guy. So I think the more important one is you talked a lot about trade and how we should be open for all options. And my question is, is there a moral limit to trade? Like, is there a point where we can say it would be amoral to continue in a trade? If there was a country, for example, which prosecuted its religious minorities in a given region, uh, had re-education camps, for example, would there be a criteria for seizing trade relations? Or is trade more important than ethics or morals? Or where would you put that line? Or is there a line? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very good question. I think in politics, moral is the most important. But the tricky thing is how you define moral. Because according to, according to my understanding, and I think this is the reason, I, I, I believe that this is the reason why people voted for me to go into the parliament, is that those people out there, they want to have politicians who are defending their interest. I'm responsible morally to my people, to my nation. I have to do what is best for them. This is the moral responsibility. This is, this is the highest level of moral responsibility what, what I have. So I cannot, I'm obviously, I cannot solve all the problems of the world. You know, I, 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 in my last 15 years, I traveled all over the world. I've been in refugee camps in, in Bangladesh. I was, um, you know, um, Boko Haram was going after me in, in, in Nigeria. I seen ISIS flags in I Iraq. So, so it's like, I, I really have the experience that the world is not always, unfortunately, it's not always and not everywhere a good place. But my responsibility is not to solve the problem of all the people. It's not the responsibility to solve the problem of others, to decide whether Israelis or Palestinians are right, whether, whether Libyans are, are, are right or the other tribes. I, 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 cannot, I cannot judge it. I, it's, it's too complex. It's too complicated. It's, it's, some problems are even unsolvable problems. But my responsibility goes directly to my people. So I think what should be done is what's best for Hungary. And this should be always the driving force. Yes, we've got a lady in the back over there. Oh, no, the guy in the T-shirt. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you. Uh, you said the war between uh, China and the USA is inevitable. And you it's said not inevitable. Not even, yes, thank you. And you said Hungary will not be part of it when it happens. And did you mean we will uh, quit the NATO? And uh, if we uh, will do this, uh, could Hungary protect itself without the NATO in a situation like that? Thank you. I think NATO plays a very important role, but according to our, my understanding and according to the NATO treaties, it's a defense alliance structure. So if any NATO member states are attacked, we have a legal obligation to go and defend them. If, if uh, Finland is attacked, if United States is attacked, then we have to be there with the Hungarian soldiers and Hungarian equipment. If we are attacked by anybody outside the NATO, then the Finns and the Americans should be here to help us to defend ourselves. But it's not about the geopolitical, nothing to do with ge ge geopolitical rivalry, nothing to do with making proxy wars. If anybody wants to make proxy wars, I'm not saying that any NATO country would, would start a proxy war, but you know, according to history, sometimes uh, these things are happening. We are not signed up for that. We are a proud members of NATO. As you've seen, we are increasing our military capabilities. We are very proud that even before the Ukrainian war started, we, we initiated the modernization of the Hungarian army, and we put a lot of energy into it even today. And according to all the NATO treaties, we will do what is needed to be done. But this is it. I think the interest of Hungary is not to be involved in any kind of confrontation at the Indo-Pacific region. It's not. 
if anything happens at the Balkan, because it's our back door, then we have a clear interest to play a stabilizing role. But should I decide all the conflicts of the Indo-Pacific region? Should I do that? If China attacks or any other country attacks our NATO members, that we are going to be there. But this is it. Thank you. I hope that answers your question. Yes, we've got a lady over here in the third row. Um, you had quite an ambitious list on your last slide. Um, do you see... Otherwise, it's worse not to do it. So where do you see a room for improvement where the government could do better? Oh, everywhere. All the 12 points. I mean... And examples? My, my idea is that we are not ready. My idea is, is these are the... If we take connectivity strategy seriously, these are the 12 most important points where we have to keep pushing, like we were discussing uh, infrastructure. Uh, the highway infrastructure, it developed very much in the last 12 years, but we are not ready. What is going on, the situation on the borders between Serbia and uh, Hungary, it's, 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 it's not 21st century. There is an ongoing uh, negotiation about the Hungarian airport, which is now owned by private investors from Canada and elsewhere, and they don't have any kind of intention to to, to put more money into the developing of, of uh, the Hungarian airport. If we don't have a serious Hungarian airport with serious connection toward the, the, the city and which is able to operate in, in, uh, also in cargo as a regional hub, if we don't have an airport like this, then, then this strategy is not going to work. So I would have many recommendations on, on various points, electricity or energy. Like right now, we are very much dependent, at least in electricity until 2030, 2032, we have to be independent. We have to be able to produce the energy, the electricity, the electricity, what is needed for us. It requires uh, greening, it requires solar, it requires POX 1, it requires POX 2, and so on and so on. It requires big, big investments. So this is a strategy which is not about the last 12 years, it's about the upcoming 12 years. Please give a big round of applause to Balazs Orban, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.